This episode is presented by Edge. Edge is our pro-to-pro advisory service, which is all about the macro with a focus on one-to-one engagement with the hedge fund manager, Craig Shapiro, and direct access to LaDuke Trading founder, Samantha LaDuke. For more information about Edge, visit www.laduketrading.com slash edge. Hey, greetings. Thank you very much for joining us for Macro to Micro Power Hour. I'm Samantha LaDuke, founder of LaDukeTrading.com and joined by our macro advisor, edge manager, Craig Shapiro. Hey there, Craig. Happy hey. almost end of the week. How are you? Doing all right? Good. It's, um, you know, earnings is always the busiest, busiest season that I have just because there are a lot of trends and swings that are open and then lots of market moving action. So the chases are robust as well and lots of client engagement asking about this, that, and the other thing. So it ends up being kind of like this breathless period of time for many, many weeks. This is actually kind of a respite for me talking macro <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. my my total focus from the live trading room to all the engagement during the day is just what's moving and why and how we're earnings. And we're still you know, just kind of getting through the last little dribs of it, but they still matter. I mean, we had we had Celsius into, you know, the, the, the wonderful report and it's just exhausting, but it's also exhilarating. Anyway, I can't wait until earnings are over. <laughs> yeah. Storage, are you afraid you asked or what? It's macro time. March is macro time, I guess, right? Okay, please. Okay. <laughs> so catch us up. We had the PCE this morning. You watch all of this data like a hawk. And we're going to talk about uh, macro event data, obviously, and then risks potentially. But right now, rally is clearly firmly still in yep. play. Look, I think, you know, the year has 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 gone. It's been pretty interesting the way that the market has brushed off the bond market and fixed income moves where yields have moved higher, right? We started the year where the market was anticipating, you know, six or seven interest rate cuts from the Fed after the after the pivot, the December meeting and and kind of post the uh the November QRA announcement. And so there was some, you know, just some euphoria about how much easing we'd get in 2024. And you kind of walk in this year and the data has reacted in a positive way. The macro data has reacted in a positive way to the significant loosening of financial conditions. And we've seen growth outperformance. We've seen the labor market remaining uh, pretty robust. And we've seen, and I've been pointing this out, a, a reacceleration of inflationary pressures that showed up in the January data at the CPI data, and then again for the PPI data, which raised the expectation for today's PCE data, came in at 0.4%, which, you know, the market has reacted as if this is like a, not a big deal and in line with a revised higher number. But if you go through the guts, which I've been going through all day, I mean, there is a significant amount of reacceleration of inflationary pressures in the economy right now. And we just got the Dallas trim mean, which kind of parses the data. And, you know, 58% of the components in the PCE now are rising at 5% or greater, which is the largest percentage uh, at 5% or greater in over a year. So, and that's up significantly from last month and, and the month prior. And the one month annualized uh, trim mean, which kind of takes out the, the highest and lowest contributors to inflation is running at 5% year on year. So the data for January is being largely seen as seasonal or one-off or weather related or insert excuse here. But as we move into March and we start getting the February data, to the extent that this data can is confirmed in February, which I suspect it will be, then we will have a situation where it's going to be even more difficult, I think, for the Fed to embrace this idea that we're going to be getting cuts, uh, you know, come summertime, we're going to be getting three cuts, and that this economy actually needs, um, you know, the interest rate. And so look, right now, the market is is trading what the Fed is saying. And so we can't trade the Fed that I can't trade the Fed that I want. I have to trade the Fed that I have, right? And the Fed that I have continues to say that policy is restrictive and that inflation is going back down percent. But it will be increasingly difficult for them to keep saying that the data continues to come in in an adverse way. And I think we, we are seeing that. We're seeing more of that. And I suspect tomorrow we get the um, ISM. And then next week we get the services, PM, uh, per PMI and the payrolls. And we'll ha we hear from Powell. And I think we're going to see, see and hear more of that talking up 
the strength of the economy and talking about labor market and inflation. And so while so far the equity market has uh, sloughed this off, uh, I'm not sure that's going to be the case uh, forever, you know, but we do have a, a strong close to February. Uh, they marked them up nicely into the close. Uh, tomorrow is a new month and we know that there's inflows uh, that come in just from 401ks that you know, people get paid on the last day of February and that, that money goes right into the 401k and that money hits the market the first day of the month. So that's tomorrow. So maybe it'll be a, you know something that, that we start to see next week with Powell. But I, I'm just, I'm not convinced that this equity market just runs and runs and runs all 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 year um, without creating a, a reaction from the Fed that will incite more tightening or less easing of policy. So on earnings, since we're almost kind of through that window, um, any any takeaways from the results? Obviously, since the cuts have just been really not put back in. Um, we have really a wide gap between expectations here of um, forward earnings and what's actually been delivered. But again, market has been rewarding wonderfully um, any beat, I'm yeah. punishing severely any miss. So this is really on its own traje you know, projectile as, as FOMO panic is still taking place, expecting this market to continue to ramp higher. Yeah. Um, in fact, um, Bank of America just came out with a 5,500 label for their new re um, revised FPX target. So right now we're still in the grip of Fed doesn't matter. Uh, they're, they're supporting this equity advance. Maybe it's in cahoots with Treasury because the, the better you know the market does, uh, companies, uh, you know, perform wages, keep getting, you know, supported, then there are better tax receipts potentially to help offset some of this treasury um, drag. But um, talk a little bit about earnings. And then, of course, talk about Yellen's next kind of rodeo, which is the end of April. For yeah. her quarterly refund. Well, I, I think this this quarter there was... So, so when when things are kind of moving in and trending in the right direction, everybody goes up. The, the earnings all get bought together, or they all get sold together, and there, there's high correlation uh, of earnings and stock performance, um, you know, throughout the quarterly reporting season. And, and we saw a lot of that in October and November reporting season, right? Mostly, uh, beats got bought and misses kind of got bought because they were, you know, um, expectations were low. What what I think we saw this quarter was a bit more of divergence, right? You needed to deliver uh, this quarter in order to outperform. And I think that typically, you know, I mean, that's healthy, right? That's good for stock pickers um, mm. and folks who can kind of get the get behind the numbers and get them right. Um, but it, I, I think it's, it's signs of a market that is, um, you know, not broadening out and is becoming more narrow. Um, and so while NVIDIA clearly knocked the cover off the ball and, and Microsoft, you know, and, and, and Meta did as well, you know, with Apple and Tesla and Google, you know, they're not back to their highs. Right. And so mm -hmm. and then we saw it even today. Right. Snow, you know, kind of got hit and CRM had gotten hit, but Okta blew it out. Right. So th there's that divergence of performance in the. In the big cap tech space, I think with respect to you know, the, the the ultimate broadening out, which would be kind of this rotation out mm -hmm. of tech into small caps. I, and I, look, I mean, we still have a, basically a third of the companies in the Russell uh, are not profitable. And I think overall, the earnings growth for this quarter came in at like, uh, you know, down 30% year on year. I just think it's difficult to holistically think that we're going to shift capital from, you know, strong IA, uh, AI re uh, related names that are beating numbers into companies that continue to miss um, where the pressures from higher interest rates and higher labor costs and higher energy costs are crimping margins. And I just, so I, I don't really see that as a sustained uh, move uh, as we, you know, keep transitioning through this year, particularly if I'm right, the inflation memory pressures are going to be stickier, which is going to prevent the Fed from easing as much as, or, you know, as much as they believe. And as and as much as the market thinks, so I think that's where things stand on that. Um, you know, I have this you know very very aggressive mode right now in chasing those small caps. Yep. Right? So I mean, as a, as a tradable context, there are select small caps, especially in biotech and retail, um, and yeah. tech, and you know, left for dead IPOs that still have a beautiful setup for higher if. Everything else kind of peters out at the top line. In other words, we go sideways in time, not price. It allows or forces some of this everything rally 
to rise up from the very oversold place yeah. of biotech and such. So it has been a theme, whether it can follow through against uh, the macro backdrop of rising rates, that's another thing to be determined. But so far, it has been a very, very profitable. Yeah, um, but you but you got to get the you got to get the names right, and you have to get yeah, yeah. The, mm-hmm. the sectors right because they don't all they're not all moving together. So this is more of a kind of a broad comment. But yeah, I, I agree, and I think we are in that kind of stock pickers market, and there are some mega themes, you know, around AI and around GLP and around you know other you know thematics, electric infrastructure, and and other and other types of things where you know the fun, industry fundamentals are good and companies are. Are delivering, but I think if you look more broadly at the global economy and the manufacturing economy, it, it's it's not great. Uh, China's not great. Uh, maybe it's bouncing off the bottom, but no, with no particular rigor. And so I, I don't think we're going to get a strong reacceleration of cyclical growth momentum, broad industrials or broad materials or commodities or or, or, or things at that are much more cyclical in nature. So I was going to say, I, think- I agree with you on that. I was asked that question repeatedly. What about commodities? What about commodities? I'm like, well, the, the market usually bottoms first, commodities later, but also they're so cyclical. They're so tied to supply demand. And this is totally separate from the conversation about the, the fact that they have been falling, quote unquote, you know, the, the Bloomberg um, commodities index. It, it's not a tell on inflation. It's not, in other words, they're trying to kind of tie them together. Food is not going down. You know, we're up 25 percent uh, on a compound basis since the COVID lockdown. There are lots of things that are higher um, from an inflation standpoint, but the rate of change has been very, very helpful. No question for also um, I know you have been on this strongly, that this is already troughed. In other words, yeah. this inflation impulse has, it's done going down. We're, you know, even if we chop about here for a little bit, Wall Street measures anyway for inflation is really still not going to ignite commodities per se as an inflation. In other words, commodities as an yeah. inflation hedge. It's not there, but we're absolutely not going back down. Yeah. Can I share my screen? Can I share down. my screen real quick? Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah, oh, look, this is something that I I was kind of talking about all day on on in my room and on Twitter. And this this is a a, a chart. I know it's hard to read on here, but I, I posted it in my in my in the mm-hmm. channel and I posted it on Twitter. And this is the super core, right? This is core services X housing inflation. And you know, month on month. So first of all, this is the year on year. So this is what, you know, th- there's been a nice progression lower. This is the first month now year on year where uh you know we've we've rallied again. We are we're back up. And notice we're 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 at three and a half percent, right? We're not at two percent. Mm-hmm. And so the Fed has talked about, you know, the three different layers of inflation. There's goods inflation, there's housing inflation, and then there's core services X housing. So this is the the, the super core, this is what is, you know, 50 plus percent of the prices. Um, and so it's just not clear to me that while there has been momentum to bring this down, this is not anywhere near going back to 2%. And then when you look at it on a month on month basis, and this is what I've been talking about, about why I think inflation is bottomed or bottomed in, in October, right? This is now the third consecutive month of sequentially stronger month on month prints. So we went from November 0.17 December 0.25. And then this January is 0.6. Right now, you can see here, I mean, 0.6 is this is the third largest month on month acceleration of super core inflation that we've basically ever seen, or at least in the last, you know, the last 20 years. And, and or, you know, well, certainly since that, you know, the pandemic, it's the second highest since the pandemic as well. And so people are looking at commodities and saying, well, commodities aren't, aren't contributing to inflation. This is a disinflationary environment. But I mean, this is, you know, 55% of the basket is showing very sizable uh, inflation momentum. I mean, and I, I think, you know, things like insurance, I, I mean, you know, I've got, I've just recently got my insurance bill for health insurance and for, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, auto insurance and for property insurance. I mean, these numbers are massive, right? They're just significantly higher. I think these are the, these are the contributions to that close to 60% of uh, components which are running 5 to 10% or higher. Um, so there is a very strong reacceleration that's already kind of underway here. You can see in here in financial services that th- this number here is kind of tied into the stock market, right? This is like portfolio management fees and other fees. I mean, another, you know, as the market does better, we're paying you pay out more to your advisor, right? Big acceleration of data here. 
Um, Does that include so, the bit the Bitcoin ETF fees that are absolutely yeah. printing? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <right now>? So, <laughs> Talk about timing. <laughs> yeah. So look, I mean, it, now it, it, in a way, I feel like um, myself and you know maybe America is being gaslit here uh, by the Fed and by the administration, you know, telling us that there's no inflation or that don't worry, it's it's under control. Um, you know, and, and I just. I'm looking at, it's like my eyes are just, you know, it's like I'm looking at the data and the data has shown reacceleration. And the question is, when will the Fed acknowledge that and put that into their calculus and into their reaction function, right? They entered the year with this idea of how the year would play out and why, you know, three cuts would be appropriate because, you know, and in their mind, these were kind of real rate normalization cuts, right? If you don't cut rates while inflation is falling, then you're incrementally adding restriction to the economy and they don't want to do that. So as inflation falls, you want to bring rates down. The question I would push back is, where is there evidence that their policy is restrictive? They keep saying it's restricted, but GDP growth in the first quarter looks like it's going to come in around 3% after 5% in uh, the third quarter and north of 3% in the fourth quarter. So GDP growth is over 3%. Inflation is reacceleration, you know, is reaccelerating. Um, and as we get upward surprises on growth momentum and a sticky uh, labor market that doesn't deteriorate, the Fed's going to have to take up their estimate for year end 24 inflation. And that will be the way that they start to price these cuts out. Now, listening to all the Fed speak this week, you, you wouldn't have, you know, they're, they're not there yet, which is, I think, is why the equity market continues to just march higher, right? The equity market is not concerned Absolutely. that the Fed is going to remove the punch bowl. But, you know, let's see what happens next week when Powell speaks and we get more data. Because last year, if you remember- When does uh, he speak specifically? He speaks Wednesday morning, Wednesday and Thursday. Mm -hmm. um, last year for the Humphrey Hawkins testimony, he delivered a fairly hawkish uh, message after, you know, the first two months of data showed reacceleration and inflation hotter and stickier than expected. Now, I'm not suggesting that that's what he's going to say, but he did do that same thing last year. Now, if you remember, he also did it the day before SDB started to blow up. So it just kind of it kind of messed up the, you know, the narrative. But the Fed did wind up uh raising rates in March, even though SVB was was basically, you know, needing to be bailed out. So um look, if if he wants to deliver that kind of message this time um and remind the market that policy is not on a preset course and if inflation comes in higher than expected, the Fed will not be cutting, you know, he he can deliver that message. And he has delivered messages like that in the past. And he typically delivers those kinds of messages after big easings of financial conditions, big rallies in markets and big vol crushes, right? Because as we've mm -hmm. discussed a bunch of times, I, I think the, the the Fed is in that kind of buying time business, right? When they when they are, and so they are vol sellers when vol gets too elevated because they just want they don't want the markets to crap out and for them to have a deflationary massively deflationary episode where risk is off and we go into some sort of big re recession. But they also don't want um, you know volatility to get too low that incites animal spirits that loosens financial conditions and that raises inflation expectations again, such that they would become unanchored. And so I think here with markets at the highs, with crypto making and ripping to, you know, to recent highs, um, and with inflation break even yields moving significantly higher since the beginning of the year, we, we are at risk that things can start to become unanchored. So um, I, I think it would be prudent for the Fed to interject and push back here. Doesn't mean that they will, but we should be mindful that if they did, and if Powell did that, do that next week, um, there could be an adverse reaction because the market is not set up for for that. And we could be in a situation where the dot plot moves in March from three cuts to two cuts. It would only take two members of the Fed going from three to change their, basically to change their mind on three versus two. Um, and so, you know, given the data that they'll have for all of January and all of February, we could be in a situation where they do that. And I think that is the that uh, that is the pathway to popping the equity bubble. And I've written about that and spoken about that. We need to remove the idea that the next move is a cut. That will be the ultimate topping situation for, for risk assets is when the market needs to uh, properly gauge whether or not the Fed actually will be cutting or may actually be raising. And I, we're not there yet, but I think we are going to be on a path towards that. So right now, all of that prefaces your model based on kind of monetary dominance, right? Where the Fed and Treasury are really kind of in control. Um, there hasn't been this transition 
into where the political pressure is, you know, put on central bank to accommodate this government deficit spending that then needs to be monetized. So what if, you know, the dollar isn't, you know, rising, which is a headwind in, in many cases to equities and yields aren't spiking higher, but staying very steady because inflation is entrenched or, as you said, it, it's, you know, uh, re-emerging. Um, it never actually left for Main Street, but I mean, as it relates to the uh, the data, what as what's your kind of reasoning, or how do you kind of justify um, the market activity with fiscal do dominance as a backdrop? In other words, I said it, this in mid November. It's very very hard to short this market, right? Double down in January. It's very very hard to short this do this market. And Jeffrey, you know, reminds our you know classical like econo economist says you can't short in fiscal dominance. So how much gravity or weight do you put into your model of looking at uh, Fed speak and Treasury QRA decisions as it relates to they just want to keep, you know, things t stuck together in an election year and somehow come up with a way to pay for the rising costs, both of the deficit spending and the interest on that debt? Yeah. So look, I mean, there, there have been various examples throughout history of central banks that have raised rates during election years. Um, and there have been various examples when they've cut during election years, and there's been examples when they do nothing. So I, I think it's hard to kind of you know suggest that the Fed here is is necessarily doing something to get one side elected versus the other side. The Fed specific. I think Treasury has a much more uh, you know political ambition, right? And so there is more incentive for Yellen to act in a way that would help keep risk assets afloat and help keep people in jobs and and, and make people excited about, you know, reelecting the current government. And so she has some and tools there. And the tax there. receipts help too. Right. But those tax receipts are not coming in right now yet, right? I mean, if you think about the way that most... So though there's an argument that says as the market improves, um, tax receipts tax receipts will go up because capital gains taxes will get paid mm -hmm. and stock comp will get paid. Now, that's true. And if you look at the historical correlations, it's it's very accurate. I just think there's a there's a timing component here that is not people who are who are selling stocks now aren't paying taxes on these until next year. But it's not just the taxes, it's also keeping folks employed and that consumption function. Yeah, yeah but, but but there's not incremental moment like we had that momentum last year right so that the, the 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 pickup in tax receipts would come from asset price gains from the stock market and from executive comp from big tech companies for folks who are uh exercising options uh and and, and so the point is we had a 54 percent advance last year in nasdaq i'm thinking they're going to get some tax receipts out of that yeah and and that's why yellen has um, you know, said that ne there will be negative bills issuance in the second quarter, right? They're ah, expecting okay. they're expecting robust tax receipts. Now, if, if she was purely political, she would have said she wouldn't have increased the duration um, schedule for the second quarter, but she did, right? We're going to be selling 500 billion of duration securities in the second quarter and then in the third quarter and then again, the fourth quarter. So I, I think Treasury can be political. Let's put that to one side. As far as the Fed is concerned, I, I think they are, look, that the, what they're trying to do is they are trying... My my sense is that they are trying to bring inflation back down to 2%. They are using interest rates to do it. And what they have gotten wrong is that pickup in interest rates has actually been inflationary because the government is the borrower, is the most leveraged player. Mm -hmm. And the government is now paying out higher interest to comp to rich people and to rich co cash rich corporations. So actually overall net interest expense hasn't moved up materially like they would have thought because people and companies have locked in low borrowing rates. And so the Fed's policy hasn't been as restrictive um, as they would have thought. The, the reason that inflation has come down so far is because of supply, mostly because of supply side uh, dynamic and, and these transitory factors that just took a little bit longer uh, to play out. And so I, I think from here, the question is, can does the, the in order for the bring the Fed, in order to bring inflation back down to 2%, the Fed would have to raise rates even more to really crimp private demand in a way that is uh, offsets the benefit that that rich people and rich folks get from the higher interest. And the problem with that is that would cause a recession. And mm -hmm. so now, yes, th there's an element of, of fiscal dominance in there, um, but it's not something that I think the Fed is actively thinking or not. They believe that their, their rate tool can work. And so I think they will keep at it. If they don't see the momentum getting back to 2%, um, they won't cut rates and maybe they'll even have to you know raise rates if, if inflation just doesn't 
reaccelerate if the iteration doesn't stop reaccelerating. So, and it's really not their problem, so to speak, to kind of discipline the or or or, or to react to the government's need for for lower interest rates at this point. Um, so while I do believe that we are in this fiscal dominance regime, I, I don't think the Fed is you know out of a desire. You know, I don't think the Fed lacks a desire yet to try, and particularly to try getting inflation down, and particularly when the data allows them to wait and the markets allow them to wait. They, they, I don't think they. I don't think there's any real need for them to provide additional accommodation by by easing. What, what, so if they really were, if they if they were really serious about getting this down, I think what they what they should have done is they should have done QT much more aggressively, brought down the balance sheet much more aggressively. It would have hit the wealth effect channel in a larger way, and they wouldn't be in a situation where they would have had to raise rates as much. There would have been a much bigger impact on QT. That that ship has sailed. But that's what they should have done. They should have sold assets. They should have been more aggressive on QT before they started raising rates because the raising of rates has actually made the problem even more difficult mm-hmm. for them because of how many people now are. are living off of 5% savings rates and companies that are- Literally. That are, so many you know, companies that aren't participating in this kind of um, FOMO move are still asset rich and incredibly, it's not it, it, It's not a growth move. It's not a you know um, speculative FOMO move, but you got a lot of companies that are still very, very fat and happy with their um, interest on cash. But as it relates to the, 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 the Fed- uh, you know, duration shock, we, they don't want, right? We don't want to have a spike in yields that causes equities to sell off. But I do think that they want inflation. It's a way to kind of, you know, default on government debt little by little. So there is a there is a very few options of um, kind of maintaining this uh, inflation, not too hot, not too cold. I don't think they want deflation. So right now, why would they make any moves unless there is uh, a, a change in the economic backdrop uh, equities have some kind of swoon, but for yeah. right now, they're they've got the sweet spot, and I think the market smells that. And the bond market, what is what is it doing? Yeah, the bond market, Something- I think, is kind of gradually coming to grips yeah. with the reality of a Fed that's not going to cut as aggressively and inflation being sticky. Right? We, you know, yields this year have moved higher. They haven't moved higher at a pace that is concerning, and term premiums haven't you know moved materially to, into positive territory. So it's it's been you know there, there's still a there's still a belief in there that the, eventually the U.S. economy will suffer uh, from this rate this rate move. Commercial real estate market ha- you know will suffer. Um, other parts of the economy that are yield sensitive will suffer. You know, starting to see more warn notices and some layoff announcements. Right. So we're getting so there is a belief in, in parts of the bond market that eventually the U.S. will have its its growth slow down or its mild recession. And so I think that's keeping maybe the back end a little more bid than than not. But you know, broadly speaking, the yields have moved higher to start the year. The dollars moved higher, and mm-hmm. equities have said yes, they're moving higher, but it, it's really not enough to offset the benefit that we're getting from from this interest payments, right? I mean, Apple and Google and these cash risk companies are making shitloads of money by just investing all the excess cash into uh, into T bills, and the companies that are struggling. Uh, and that's why you're seeing this, you know, uh, rise in bankruptcies, right? There, there, there are companies that need capital that can't get it, and if you have capital. You have an unlimited amount of it and you're actually earning on it, right? So there's this bifurcated economy, bifurcated market where the haves keep winning and the have nots kind of keep losing. Check this out. I got to share because I thought that was a fascinating article. Can you see that? Yeah. Debt addicted companies look to equity as interest uh, interest costs skyrocket for the first time in over two decades. It is cheaper to sell shares than issue debt. Yeah. So comment. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm surprised more. I'm surprised we haven't seen already an equity, you know, secondaries being. Uh, and we saw a couple of convert started to see some converts, right? SMCI did a convert, and there's another uh, biotech company. So I, I think we'll see. Maybe we'll start to see more of that in coming days and weeks. Um, but yeah, I think that that's, you know, if, if companies want to survive, they they, they should be, um, you know, doing more to raise equity here. I think that makes a lot of, uh, that would make a lot of sense. And, you know, that that could provide some uh, headwind to, uh, you know, to market momentum as we start to see more supply to offset the the share buybacks and the, you know, and and the, the demand, so. But it is a, a, a new trend very early in that assessment. I'm not quite sure that would um, support my kind of uh, nine 
1995-esque market feel in some regards, because this market does have a little bit of that. But getting back to just a kind of a, a comment on the fiscal dominance. And by the way, this is open to uh, q and I forgot to even mention that at the beginning. Duh. Power hour. Ask questions. Hit us up in, uh, in Zoom Q&A. All right. So what is the risk, though, that we need to kind of look for as it relates to it boiling the frog slowly? In other words, inflation is a way to default on government debt little by little. Um, when do we get kind of a real problem for the Fed is if market interest rates begin to rise with economic recovery? Is that good or bad? And then it, does that force banks to start lending out uh, some of their excess reserves? Actually, they have a lot of excess reserves. That would be much more inflationary. Would there be any reason why you would see banks start lending out some of their excess reserves, which would be, definitely be a uh, a sign or a tell for uh, further inflation. Yeah, I don't. I don't suspect that there there that there will be. Um, I think banks are still trying to come to grips with the reality of the commercial real estate situation and just real estate broadly speaking, what what their exposures are, and so more companies are reserving more are going to have to reserve more for the losses there. Right, we're just starting to see kind of the early recognition of losses in some of the office properties and some of the banks that are exposed there. So, but there look, are also I, I, there are a lot of folks waiting in the sidelines to pick up those, you know, pennies on the dollar type of deals. So it, it, and the more time that goes by, uh, CRE gets to kind of repair itself. It's a very slow heel, but it does not trigger contagion. It obviously yeah. would have by now. It's been- Yeah, well, look, I, I think one of the issues is that the, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of changing the way that finance, you know, gets done uh, and which companies and which industries need finance. Um, you know, the the traditional model of going to the bank and borrowing and getting a loan, uh, you know, is increasingly being replaced by, by an equity, you know, uh, the equity culture, right? And not even just the kind of big cap uh, or big tech equity culture and VC culture, but even smaller companies that are want to hold, want to retain more of their ownership, um, just raising, you know, via e equity capital as opposed to debt capital. And so, you know, I think that there is a, you know, a dynamic in play there for for banks. Where are they going to be? What kind of loans are they be, are they going to be making? And, and it's not as if we need or, or, or said differently the 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 trends in AI and GLP and some of the mega themes uh, are not capital intensive, right? So we don't need debt finance for, you know, for a lot of those, um, a lot of those industries and the industries that typically would get debt finance, capital intensive industries, um, the returns are not there for them to be investing. And so there, there's a there's a dearth of, of, of demand for loans, right? We're, you know, and particularly, you know, for some of the commodity, more commodity sensitive stuff, a lot of these companies are just, they're not they're not raising capex. So eventually this is going to be a problem, right? Eventually we're going to need to invest in oil and oil infrastructure and copper and like, but right now it's not, we're not seeing a, a massive reacceleration of demand for that kind of lending. And so- No, in um, fact, CNI loans have, have started to roll over. So- Yeah, but so I- so The it's, capex it's, story with tech though is hot fire flames. Everybody's very excited about that. <laughs> yeah. So I think bank, I, I don't really see a, a big pickup in kind of bank lending in that, in that manner. Um, but- Look, I think the, I think what the Fed is trying to do is they are trying to keep a, a enough inflation around to help the government uh, pay its debts, uh, encourage tax receipts, encourage speculation, but not create enough inflation or too much inflation that it becomes a societal issue or it becomes an election issue. And that's a that's a delicate delicate balance. And you could argue so far they've done a very good job. Um, you know, they were obviously were late to the party. People got annoyed and inflation went to 9% and, and markets got hit in 2022. But since then, well, since late 2022, as, as the you know, Fed has raised rates, brought inflation down, even though most of it's not been because of them, it's because of the supply side, but whatever. They've been able to keep inflation expectations well anchored. Um, you could argue they've done a reasonably good job. There hasn't been any rioting uh, about high prices not in America. Not here, Europe. In, in, oh right, in America. Goodness. No, in America. South America, yes. And, and so- uh, the question is from here into November, can the Fed kind of continue delivering that message or do prices and does the equity market kind of reignite in a way that people uh, really start to get aggravated more about inflation? And, you know, that'll show up in confidence numbers, that'll show up in poll numbers, and um, that'll, that'll show up in uh, a variety of different ways. And so I think, you know, maybe right now what the equity market is sniffing out is a Fed that is swung the pendulum properly 
um, got inflation down to a point. But what I'm seeing is this reacceleration is is already underway. It's becoming much more entrenched. And how far can they allow it to go before it becomes an issue that they need to address? And I, I don't know the answer, ending? but I, I think after they get the February data that confirms that January wasn't a fluke, it's going to become more top of mind for them to try to think about how to deal with it. All right. So that's coming up for March. Um, what about the BTFP, the bank facility that ends on March 11th? That's a question. And the any worries there? I think you said you weren't because they've got basically a year extension. They have a year left, right? So basically, as of March 11th, there will be no new uh, lending into that, but you have a year to pay back that loan. So um, I don't anticipate that's going to be too much of an issue uh, for liquidity. And you know, broadly speaking, there banks that need liquidity can still find liquidity at the standing repo facility and or or the discount window. So there is ample liquidity around still. Um, and I think that, you know, the one, again, a, a way to bring down inflation would be to remove the ample liquidity that, that or the excessive liquidity that, that is still around. It's still um, around though. It, by by some measurements, it's three trillion. There's I mean, bank lot. reserves themselves are three and a, still three and a half trillion. They're, 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 That's you know, a there's, been, there's basically <laughs> all the money from the, you know, the money from the RRP, which was over two trillion, mm -hmm. um, you know, half a trillion went into the TGA from zero, and the other trillion and a half went to bank reserves. And so bank reserves now are at eighteen month highs. And so there's plenty of liquidity that banks have uh, to do whatever they want to do and and lend in a way to financial participants. And I think that's what we're getting is inflation, financial market inflation, and wealth effect inflation is kind of filtering through the real economy and making it more difficult to get back to two percent. So the Fed should be removing liquidity. Um, but they're not. I anticipate that's what they're, that's not what they're doing, right? Even Logan, who had the speech earlier this year, you know, there was an article yesterday that said she was surprised by the market's reaction to her because she basically said, this doesn't mean that we're going to stop early. It just means we're going to take a longer time to get to, you know, till we don't have a blow up. And the market took that as saying, well, they're going to stop QT in the middle of this year, which was not her intent. It's almost like the the, the Fed still does not understand how the market um, the reaction reacts to their, their words. And they don't do enough to dissuade market participants from taking whatever they say into the direction that they want. All right. So when do they next get to talk down the market? Because we also have um, other structural flows that are supported of the market. And I do mean buybacks, CTAs, option flow, um, earnings are over, but we we definitely, definitely have um, a, you know, a, a structure underneath the surface that says, hey, these short upside calls that uh, folks were, were chasing, um, and even if they were shorting, the, the market has risen into them, so they need to buy them back. I mean, the, the whole tail wagging the dog in the options market is continuing to fuel this energy for higher plus the other kind of in price insensitive quants and and the like. So the question is when will they speak the uh you know the restrictive language that causes those flows to slow and potentially uh, revert. Yeah, look, I mean we we are as we push through tomorrow and into early next week we'll we'll start to get because it's expiry is early in March. Um, tomorrow's the first, and March expiry is the fifteenth. Um, the fixed expiry comes after that. So, look, we're 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 back to that point in the cycle where you know the buyback flows and the hedge flows start to get um, unwound, and there will be kind of natural buying pressure, um, you know, into into that March expiry. So, yeah, and the GS blackout it, it, window starts on March fourteenth and lasts all the way to April twenty sixth. You're saying for buybacks? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it's really more. More of a end of March, you know, most companies can, can't, can't buy a month before. So, but yeah, I mean, peak share buyback blackout will be kind of by the last week of March and for the, you know, for, for the basically all of April. But look, I think the Fed next week, Powell has, Powell has the last chance here, right? If he wants to uh, say, cut it out. Um, if he doesn't on Tuesday, uh, Wednesday, then I, I suspect we'll just bubble up uh, even more into mm -hmm. the March expiry um, for- uh, That's my call. <laughs> for for the fifteenth, and you know they had those J.P. Morgan flows for the end of the quarter. Um, but like, again, I think Powell has the opportunity next week. We need to be mindful of that. 
he ha- he he could say something that is incredibly um, hawkish because he will have you know some data that allows him to do that if he wanted to tighten the financial conditions. I'm not saying he's going to, but we have to be aware that there is a, a chance he he will because he's done it before. He mm-hmm. did it at the Jackson Hole speech a couple of years ago. He did it last year. So there's you know if he wants to smack the market a little bit, he can. Um, and if he doesn't, then I suspect we're gonna probably keep chasing higher into the March expiry, supported by those buyback flows. And then on the flip side of that, you know, I think the day basically the day before expiry. And the short t- gamma dealer flows. Yeah, exactly. We mm-hmm. get, now we do get the, the CPI data point. I think that's on March 12th. Um, so that is a couple of days. I'm just confirming. Um, that is on, yeah, March 12th, which is Tuesday uh, of expiry week. So obviously that'll be, and then we get PPI on Thursday, the combination of that kind of creates the PCE for the end of the month. So that that expiry week will be important, um, but probably between Powell and that CPI, I could see how we just kind of bubble up. And then depending on what the P, the how the inflation data comes in, if it comes in hot, um, you know, that will be, I think, a concern. If it came in cool, then we'll start knocking in all these calls that you're, that you're with that, that, dealer, <laughs> that dealers are short, right? So I have um, to show it because we do always have the potential of volatility repricing equities, but we also have the potential of a crash up in markets simply by the dynamics of this. This this dealer gamma, you know, literally chasey behavior where their short gamma and the upside strikes and they due to client demand and they just have to work themselves into it and it's supportive. So we really have to kind of look at the fact that the spot right now, that 5100 call wall and all that stuff, we could absolutely build out into further strikes, which is probably why Bank of America, you know, came out today and said, ah, ah, excuse me, excuse me, we're going to, we're going to revise that to 5,500. They're looking at stuff like this. Yeah. It's a potential. It's, it's still a backdrop I see of why we can also have that kind of rounding out. I hate to call it the everything rally, but the junk that if it's selectively chosen, (laughs) either. Yeah, look, I mean, the the most short (laughs) basket, right, is a good representation of Yes, um, it's not the only representation because it is junk. There are still a whole bunch within, you know, biotech. We've been crazy, crazy about this. Thanks, uh, uh, you know, in large part to Alex, our biopharma um, analyst and trader. But I mean, he's really, really gotten in there and figured out which ones are real, right? (laughs) Which ones are just a trade. Yeah, but But I guess what I'm I'm saying is you have have a a good... uh, amount of capital that trades in a long short capacity that runs lower volatility strategies in the multi-manager community that is forced to short stocks, right? And mm-hmm. the most short basket is now up like 50% from the lows yep. at the end of October. And it's up, you know, 25% in in four weeks or so. So um, it doesn't mean that, you know, so it's come far, it could keep going, it hasn't taken out the, the July highs yet. But typically, what we get is we, we, we get exhaustion on these shorts, right? And we get um, kind of buying exhaustion and get the RSIs of this short basket up to 99, the 99th percentile or very elevated levels. And that just kind of shows you the, these max pain points for the multi-manager community. And then that, that's, and then they, and then that's it. And that's your blow off in that. And then we start to, um, see those fall again as people regross into good longs and, and good shorts. So, I think we're in the phase now where we're having a bit of a beta rally. Shorts are going up more than longs. Even some of the long, you know, longs haven't even really, some of the best longs have kind of stalled out. Um, and so I think some of the hedge fund community is probably in some pain here as their longs are going up less than their shorts. That could continue, you know, for another couple of days or week or so. But um, at the point when we start to see the most short basket stall out, I think that would be uh, a good time and a good tell to say, okay, the nonsense part of this rally is is over. Um, and then we should go I and wish. Look. Yeah, we no, I'm, I'm not saying it hasn't happened yet. I'm just saying that, that again, these share. are the signs. Yeah. These are the yeah, signs no, no, no. to look for. This I, this I agree with you. When that does peter out in a particular short basket, then we absolutely, the next step is volatility. Doesn't mean it's going to be a, a, a trend reversing volatility, but we usually do have shake and bake. But I have to also show you, because we were just talking about the uh, the, the Gamma Dealer, you know, Nomura chart. Um, this is a buy right monthly index, which kind of shows you that they are still all bold up, you know, on the lows here of October, right before the Fed pause of November 1st and yelling Yahtzee, right? We got above, technically, this is my intermarket, but still, we got above the 10 and then just really have held that extremely well. Spy is an orange. We came back down only one week in January, right? When we had big 
tech kind of softness for that uh, first of the year selling. Um, and we got right back up on top. It's only recently rolled over. And I literally posted this for clients going, okay, let's see if it gets back above the 10. Look at the gap that came in. That was just on, you know, the NVIDIA excitement, post NVIDIA excitement. So this is all of SPY, <laughs> um, but it's still, they're chasing, they're chasing higher. We have not rolled over it. Even if you don't study the option structure market, you can kind of just use that as a tell to say, we, we, we just, mm -mm, they're not, they're, they're not giving up yet. We need a reason. We need a macro trigger. Yeah, look, if we're not going to get, I think the, again, the precursors for the equity market to care are a, a view or a, a understanding that the Fed is no longer going to be providing a level of accommodation um, to this market that it expects because the market is consistently in an incessant need for liquidity. And so the Fed has allowed the animal spirits to take over and has allowed the market to make highs and has basically said they're still going to be cutting this year, even though growth is better than expected and inflation is higher than expected. And if that's what the Fed is going to do, then yeah, it makes sense why NASDAQ is making highs and crypto is making highs, risk on, you know, and, and most short names are make, making highs. And so the question from here is how long will the Fed let this last? And the reason I focus so much on the Fed versus Treasury or anything else is because tre the, the, the the U.S. government's budget is set, right? Like there, there is no tax increases coming this year. There's no incremental spending cuts, right? We, we, it's a known what we're getting out of Treasury and out of D.C. So we don't have to focus as much on the incremental changes. It, the only thing that could really change here is, is, well, two things. One could be some sort of exogenous risk, right? War or whatever. New um, sheriff but, in town. But well, the, 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 I'm saying imminently. Um, okay. Before, you know, but and and then the Fed, how does the Fed react to all of this, all of this data? And so if the Fed is going to loosen policy while the government is running 6% plus deficits at full employment, then, you know, we are in an inflationary world. You want to sell bonds, which we've been saying all year. We don't yep. want to be in bonds. That's been the right. You want to buy crypto and Bitcoin, which we've been saying all year and has been right. At least I've been. And and as far as equities are concerned, yeah, you know what we've been saying is I've been more negative on equities because I, I thought that equities were going to react more to the dollar strength to um, the, the move in yield. But it's it hasn't been outside. We have, I haven't been short tech and some of the small cap stuff as, as way underperformed. So yeah, it's been the wrong call on, on equities, but it's been, I think, more than made up for with, with Trading Bitcoin. Trading is not a with, game of perfect. We're figuring and, this and out. <laughs> yeah. And so- from here, how long is the Fed going to allow this to, to go on? And I think what we have is a market that is going to shoot for the level that makes the Fed uncomfortable. It, I like I how you put that. It, it, yeah. I don't know if it's at 5,100. I don't know if the Fed is uncomfortable yet. 5,200, NASDAQ 20,000, Bitcoin 100,000, right? Are, like maybe those are the levels that the Fed becomes uncomfortable. But there is, you know, oil, you know, I think one of the things that's benefited the Fed has been oil, right? Oil hasn't yeah. made a substantial upward move yet because, you know, most Americans um, who aren't, like, I think most Americans are are following inflation much more closely than ever before. But without gasoline, you know, gasoline, you, you, you see that every day, you see that every week, until and unless gasoline really starts to move higher, people feel okay. Yeah. If gasoline was, no, look, gasoline is, it has been moving higher for the last several weeks and is almost now higher year on year on a retail, at the retail level. Um, so we are getting closer to that point. But if gasoline goes from here, um, then I think the Fed is completely screwed. And they will it's have to- been inflation tell for you know for rising expectations but it's still not allowed to go up it's i firmly believe it's in the category of a not allowed to go up yeah look they, i mean i think in. um you know we'll see right we'll see yeah. how the gov how the administration deals with that are there things that are there levers they could pull keep gasoline prices from moving higher sure um but if it, it goes if it moves higher then the fed will feel uncomfortable and if you know s p is at 5500 maybe the fed's uncomfortable there like i said bitcoin at a hundred thousand, right? The, the market will start shooting for those levels. It's it's like the, the tapping, it's tapping. like the opposite of the bond vigilantes, right? In a way, like bond vigilantes that you know would would take would, would sell fixed income to force governments to react um, and cut spending or raise taxes. It, it's almost like we. Have, it's not that it's like an inverse. Yeah, I guess it's like an inverse. It's like the equity vigilantes are rallying risk so much so now to force 
the Fed to to tell them to to stop, right? And the reason they want you have to tell them to stop is because that inflation is going to run out of control again. Um, and I think that's that's the stage that we're in right now. I don't know if the Fed feels uncomfortable yet. I think after listening to the Fed speeches over the last two weeks, they're not uncomfortable yet. It doesn't mean that they're not going to get more uncomfortable now that just got this data point again today and, and for the next few weeks. But, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how they react to this data. All right. Well, I think that that... Um... <laughs> We have, I have so many charts I want to ask you about and topics I want to kind of go through, but big picture, the market is bullish and till it has a reason not to be. We definitely have controlled, quote unquote, yield, inflation, oil spikes, or they're just not allowed, even dollar. Um, We didn't talk about Bank of Japan, their statement yesterday by a board member who said we need to end and, you know, go normal, but um, it's still a prap shoot as to when. Any other inferences from uh, Bank of Japan because we have such a strong uh, carry trade potential on wine, which could trigger what we also have in bond land, which is very much this, um, you know, their short bonds, long NASDAQ, very, very strong um, pair trade. Anything that would uh, come in from Asia? Yeah, look, I mean, these are not that these are exogenous risks, but these are the, the you know, the, this is where the, the international scene could upset the apple cart, right? If Japan really does go through with tightening cycle, um, I actually, there's actually some comments right now from you, Ada, on the tape where he's saying um, inflation is easing at a quick pace. Wage negotiations mm -hmm. will offer tailwinds. So it's almost like he's pushing back to the statements last night. Yes. Um, yeah. So look, I, I don't, there will be a time when Japan decides to normalize policy in some respects uh doesn't seem like we're there it's yet not, yeah um they they do meet this time before the fed i believe so they would never um, do it brief, brief, brief. so agreed i, I don't imagine. so but that's yeah that's that there's a there's a chance that if they were to tighten policy uh carry trade unwind yields move higher uh would be an issue and then the other one is china right china is going into the npc meetings this week uh next week and i think there's always the expectation that china will stimulate more you know to the extent that that is not the message that comes out of there and and they're kind of happy just allowing the economy to to bleed out slowly mm -hmm. um you know folks who are have been chasing the china rally may be disappointed you know so we'll it hasn't see gone it. anywhere <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's Despite been a lot of call. There's been a lot of call buying. It's had a good bounce off the lows, um, yeah. but but I don't I don't think that's something necessarily that will back up and and hit the U.S. too much. I think what would hit the U.S. from China would if, if there was a devaluation of the RMB. I think that would be something that the U.S. market would have to take into consideration. And then in Europe, it seems like Europe is kind of just doing what Europe does. It's not you know, it's maybe it's bouncing off the bottom, but not really doing a, a whole lot there. Inflation is a little bit stickier. ECB Except is the kind Bank of, of England did say they may sell their whole QE portfolio in a <laughs> Yeah, look at that that's what I was saying earlier that I thought the Fed should should do, which in order to bring down inflation, um, they should be more aggressive on the balance sheet and not on rates. Maybe the Bank of England is is thinking similarly. I mean, we'll see. Uh, that, that hasn't been uh confirmed by no, policy it's, yet, it's but it's something sell. that, it's that it's a, yeah, but yeah. um but yeah, those are the types of things that would tighten financial conditions that would raise term mm -hmm. premium. Th those are the things that you'd be looking for to say, okay, this has gone too far. But right now, we're not really there yet. And so mm -hmm. I suspect that That's we're going to keep moving higher until until we get to that point. We got to find the Fed call, right? They used to say That's the markets true. were falling. We have to look for the, the Fed put. Well, now we're looking for the Fed call, right? 100%. Where does the Fed come in and say enough is enough? That's what we're trying to identify. Because I think when they do say it is going to be an issue. It won't for be the subtle. Market. Yeah, it won't well, it won't be subtle and it will be an issue, right? It's it, it, it will be it will be something you know, because that would when they if and when they come out and say that, it, it will basically remove any rate cuts this year. Because then they'll move into a window where they, they can't cut. It's too close to the election. Rate cuts are off the table. And then people are saying, oh, shit, it's April. I thought we were going to get cuts. Now we're going to get no cuts until 2025. This is a problem, right? But we're not, you know, we're not there. We're not there yet. Yeah. All right. Well, well, we'll keep looking for it. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. Macro to Micro Power Hour. We pop in and do this uh on occasion, probably next FOMC. I mean, we're getting close into March. What uh, what date is that again? Just top of mind. I'm going to be gone the week before. 20. Heads on the 20th. Okay. So let's, 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 you know, for sure do that on the 20th. How, how about? And in yeah. the meantime, wish everyone a great rest of the week. You can check us out, LaDukeTrading.com if you are new to us. 
oh my goodness, Craig runs the Macro Advisor product. We also have other fabulous uh, analysts and traders on the desk. And basically you are accessing all of us and uh, we wish you a great afternoon. Thank you so much. Thanks, take care. Bye. Subscribe to LaDuke Trading YouTube channel for more macro to micro power hour videos and other content.